What's up, guys? Welcome to this week's live stream. In this live stream, Monica is not going to be moderating the channel, but I'm going to be talking about some special things that you guys might be interested in. For example, uh, I have gotten a couple of questions of people asking me about our pension benefits at Kaiser. There was this one nurse who messaged me re uh, recently, just a couple of hours ago, actually, and she told me that she got a job at Stanford and she's been working there as a psych nurse. But recently, she decided to go into med surge. So she's trying to get into med surge, and then she's going to switch gears and apply for a job at Kaiser Permanente. And when she transfers over, she's trying to figure out if it's worth it because her main goal is to have a really lofty pension by the time she retires. So I actually created a pension calculator for anybody who's working at Kaiser. Uh, hold on a second. All right. What is up? Welcome to the channel, guys. Okay, so I created a pension calculator for anybody who's interested in working for Kaiser. And I'm going to include it in uh, the description, actually, of this video so you guys can access it. But I'm going to go through it here as well so you guys can follow along and see how much you could potentially have if you work for Kaiser and you end up going, um, you end up working there until you retire. Uh, or you might want to retire early. Let's say you retire by the age of 55, that's considered early in Kaiser terms. So I can show you what with the calculator, how much money you would have at age 55 if you were to, to retire from Kaiser at that point. I'm also going to be talking about some of the salaries in different hospitals across California. There's been recent updates, especially with uh, hospitals like Stanford, the UC hospital system, like every UC hospital, including UC Berkeley, UCSF, UC San Diego, UC Davis, like all these hospitals have updated salaries. So I'm going to go, be going over some of them, but not all of them. I'm also going to be talking about the increase in rates for Kaiser Permanente. So you guys are going to be able to see what the salaries are going to look like for anybody who's interested in working at Kaiser Permanente. And uh, maybe we can take some questions. And if you have questions along the way, I'll be free, more than happy to answer those questions. Okay, so let's see. Hello, is it difficult to get a job at one of the really good hospitals in Northern California? It's going to be just as hard to get a job in California as it is in another state like New York, Oregon, Washington. It's just it's the same thing. You just got to apply. OK, so I'm going to see if I can share my screen and I can show you guys exactly what it is uh, that the pension benefit looks like. OK, so let's see. All right. And just let me know in the comment section, just if you can see what I'm showing you on the screen. Okay, so uh, let's see. All right, everybody's there. Can you see it? Can you see what I'm showing you? Okay, I see that um, 90 State of Mind joined the chat. I got, he said, uh, I got a job at DSH State Hospital, Kualinga. Would you recommend that as a new grad? Honestly, I'll recommend anything as a new grad. Just get whatever job you can, and then you can transfer over to one of the highest paying hospitals that you can possibly work in. All right, guys, okay, okay, so I see you can see it. Let me just show you the entire screen. Okay, hopefully you can see that. I'm gonna zoom in for you guys too. So let's see. All right, this is at 125%. Let me see if I can make it a little, okay. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, but basically I'm gonna also show you um, or read to you what the Kaiser uh, pension portion of our contract states. So let me see if I can look for it over here. Hold on a second. Um, okay, I'm gonna do a search in the Kaiser contract and I'm gonna share this screen with you guys as well so you guys can see what I'm looking at. So let's see, present, share screen, and here we go. I'm gonna share the contract so you guys can see exactly what I'm searching for. Okay, so this is the Kaiser contract. And I'm going to go to page 107 on the Kaiser contract so I can look up exactly what the pension benefits law um, part of the contract states. So page 107, I'm just scrolling down till I find it. And, and you know, guys, like I'm constantly reading these contracts. That's why like when you, typically when you ask me a question related to the contract, I already know the answer for the most part because I'm always reading these contracts. Okay. All right, so this is the line that you guys are going to have to really understand. Uh, where is it? Pension service. Okay, it's at the top. 
Um, let's see, insurance. Okay, this is the Kaiser, Kaiser Permanente Employees Pension Plan. And uh, let's see, I'm gonna keep scrolling down because this is actually not the most important part. Oh, but I should mention that if you are someone who's working per diem, you can still qualify for the pension as long as you're working 1,000 1, 1, hours or more per year, right? Um, and then uh, let's see. And if you work 1,800 hours or more per year, then you get full a full year of credit uh, towards your pension. Okay. Now, I just want to scroll towards, okay, normal retirement. This is what I need you guys to understand. So an employee is entitled to a normal monthly pension if he or she retires on his or her 65th birthday and has completed at least one year of pension service, okay? So that means you are considered someone to have been retiring like a normal person if you retire at the age of 65, right? Then it says here that the normal monthly retirement income shall be 1.4% of your final average monthly compensation. The final average monthly compensation, okay? And that means that the final average monthly compensation is the average of your base monthly compensation or your base monthly pay rate for the highest 60 consecutive months within the last 120 months of work. Then you take that number, which is the average monthly rate, and you multiply it by the years and partial years of credited service, right? So I will, I'll go over that in the spreadsheet, but just understand what I'm reading right now. For the purposes of determining your monthly, av your average monthly compensation, the base monthly compensation rate shall include evening and night shift differentials. That means that they want you to understand that it's not just your base rate that they want you to include in your calculation. They want you to include also your differentials. So if you work evening shift, if you work night shift, if you work the weekend, every other weekend or every weekend, I should say, you need to include that in your calculation. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna show you uh, actually, I should also mention that they increased from 1.4% to 1.45% after 2007, okay? So now I'm going to show you what the pension calculator shows, All right? So I'm going to stop sharing the other screen. Let's see. Stop, okay. And I'm going to share this one so you can see the spreadsheet that I created. And I created this spreadsheet a long time ago but um i never really got around to talk about it much until you know this nurse asked me about it earlier this morning okay so now i want you first let me make sure this is big so you guys can see all of it okay uh okay so i want you to, guys to see that uh where is it right here okay um if you are making an annual salary of, let's say right now, me, for example, because I reduced my hours, right? I'm working 20 hours a week and I'm making, I believe my pay is right around $100 per hour. So I'm making somewhere around $120 per year, $120,000 per year. So I'm going to put that into my annual income portion over here. And then you're going to see what my pension benefits are going to look like after one year of service, five years of service, 10, 17, 25, 33, 40, and so on. And this is assuming that I'm going to get a 2.5% raise every single year until I retire. And as far as I can tell, since Kaiser has had a union, this rate has been at least 2.5, if not higher. The most recent contract that we got We've, we're getting about, I believe it's like 21, 22% over the next three years. Okay. So it's at the moment, it's at least 5%, right? Okay. So my monthly average income at the moment is up is $10,000, but you are not vested within the Kaiser system until you've worked there for five years. And what does that mean? It, okay. So if you've been vested, that means that if you were to leave the hospital, you could pull out your balance. You could withdraw the balance of your pension when you leave the hospital. 
You still have to pay taxes on it, but you can pull out what ba the balance that you have, right? So um, another thing I should mention is that if you retire at the age of 55, between the age of 55 and 65, right before you reach 65, then this is what your monthly uh, retirement benefit is going to look like if you've only been working for one year. But obviously, you cannot get it. You cannot get your pension after one year. So you would have to look at this row. It's going to be seven hundred and sixty-one dollars and twenty-five cents if we if you retire um, regularly. Sorry, and if you retire, um, what am I looking at? Sorry, guys. Uh, annual, monthly. Okay, yeah. The annual is going to be $9,135. And that's how much you're going to get on an annual basis. But if you retire at 50, between 55 and let's say 64, right before you hit 65, you're going to have $4,568. And that's how much you're going to get in retirement. That's nothing. Like you can't do anything with that. So you would expect to be working at least like 25, 33 years to even get anything if you're only making $120,000 a year. But like I told you guys before, most of the nurses that I work with are making at least like 180, 200,000 and up, right? And that's worth working an average of 32 to 36 hours a week. So let's increase this. Let's say you're making $180,000 a year. And also you gotta remember, this is the annual income, is, is my current annual income as well, right? So if I chose to work more and increase my income every single year, right before I retire, because they include the last 10 years, I believe it's the last 10 years, um, then you you have to make sure that you're working the most amount towards the end of your retirement so you can max this out as much as possible. All right, so $180,000 annual income, that's $15,000 a month, right? Um, if I were to be working with Kaiser, let's say for 10 years, I'm making $16,500 a month at that point, and my annual salary by then would be like, say, $198,000. My monthly retirement benefit is $2,392. And this is if I retire like a just a normal retirement, which is $28,000 a year. And uh, that would be $14,000 uh, a year if I choose to retire before the age of 65. So as you can see, it's really not that much. Um, but it's, I mean, it's a decent amount if you choose to wait until you're 65. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go back to the, uh, the live and answer some of your questions. Wow. There's a lot of questions already. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing that screen and I'll share another screen with you guys later. So you guys can see, uh, something else that I want to show you. Okay. So stop sharing. All right. Um, let's see, please zoom. I did, uh, let's see. Okay. My question is not really topic specific, but would like to know which among the following states would highly would you highly recommend for me to move? Uh, California, Nevada, or Texas? I'm currently in South Carolina working as a rehab RN. Okay, so uh, it's not specific to the state that I talk about all the time, but I have a spreadsheet for that. And I went over it last time, but I'll go over it again so you guys can see what the pay looks like in other states. Because honestly, it's not, you don't have to move to California to like live a decent life as a nurse. You can just move to a state. Actually, you would have to move to a specific city within a state in order to maximize your income. Because if you just move to a state because they have no income tax, then you might end up in one of the highest cities within that state. So at the end of the day, you're actually still going to be left with a lot less money than you would have had you moved to a low cost of living city within that state. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So um, I'm going to show you guys uh, this. Hold on a second. Um, it's this, and again, all these spreadsheets besides the Kaiser Pension Benefits one, it, they're all located either right below this video in the description, or there's a card if you click on it uh, towards. I don't know. This there's a button. I think it's either there or uh, <laughs> right there somewhere. Um, after this video is posted, you guys will be able to see it. Uh, you can also go to the website that we have is nurses to riches.com and you can uh, just go to the shopping area and buy it from there. All right. So now um, I'm going to share this screen and show you guys exactly what you can afford or how much money you're going to have at the end of your paycheck if you move to a high paying city. So you're looking at California, Nevada, or Texas, right? Let's do that. I'm going to share it with you. Okay. So I hope you can see this. 
right? I'm actually going to remove myself from it so you can see much better. And let's do that. Okay. I hope you can see that. So let's go over here. All right. Now you said California, Nevada. So I'm going to select those states from my list here on the left hand side. That's Nevada. And this is Texas right over here. Okay. So I'm just looking at NP salaries. I don't want to look at NP salaries, right? I want to look at RN salaries. And it, you know, you guys, um, I don't know if you're aware, but I have this spreadsheet is available for like several different prof professions. It's not just for nurses. Like if you're an NP, if you're a CRNA, if you're a doctor, I have, uh, you know, like the salaries for different uh, like attending or physician positions. For example, like I have cardiologists, I have surgeons, this, it's all in there. And if you're a paramedic, it's in there. All right. So, and clinical instructors, LPNs, it's all in there. All right. So let me just go back over here. All right. So I'm going to select RN. And then it automatically sorts it. Um, initially, it's going to be left, how much you're going to have left over annually um, after you pay uh, for, after you have your taxes deducted, after your mortgage payments are made. And this is based on an APR of 6.77%. Now, it's, we all know it's much higher than that now. Uh, so I'm going to be updating this spreadsheet in the next few weeks because I need to update the program that runs all of the code that gives me all of this data. Okay. All right. So let's go. Um, as you can see here, these are the highest paying and most of them are in California, right? Port Arthur, Texas is the first city outside of California that is going to be comparable to the other cities in California. And that's because the home prices in Port Arthur, Texas are $79,394 average, right? It, it, it can be higher, it can be lower. And that means your monthly mortgage payment at 6.77% APR is going to be $513. That means that after you get your taxes deducted, uh, from your median salary and you pay your mortgage payments every month every year you're going to have fifty three thousand five hundred and forty four dollars which is actually i mean it's not that bad but if you look here in these other other cities in california it's going to be much higher and why is that um so let me just do this real quick okay the reason for that is because uh like i told you california pay is much higher because of the cost of living obviously but one thing you should consider when you move to California, it doesn't have to be in like one of the highest paying areas in Northern California, it could be anywhere, is uh, when you're working in California, in California, you're getting paid time and a half after working eight hours. And But I did make a video recently talking about how that's not always the case. For example, if you're working for Kaiser, you are not going to be paid time and a half if you're a 12 hour shift employee. And the reason for that is because the union negotiated this into the contract many, many years ago because they wanted more 12 hour shift positions. But what they did negotiate into the contract was that they asked Kaiser to pay these nurses the differential, uh, whether it's uh, evening dif differential or night shift differential throughout their entire shift. So there's no 12 hour shift employee that's just making the base pay. They're either getting paid evening shift or night shift differential. So that's the benefit to those nurses that are working 12 hour shifts. But if you're an eight hour shift employee uh, you, if, and you work, let's say day shift from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., you're not gonna get the, the evening shift differential for that shift. But what you will get is the benefit of being able to stay an additional four hours and getting paid the time and a half. So um, that's one thing that Oliver did previously. And he, when he moved from North Carolina to uh, Kaiser Permanente in California, is that he made sure that he applied to a, an eight hour shift position because he knew after watching my videos that he was not going to get paid the time and a half if he was working 12 hour shifts. Okay. All right. So let's go back to this list. Um, and you know what? Maybe I can go over the highest paying for several different things and professions and cities. Okay. And, and states. Uh, so let's go back here. Um, okay. Um, so you can see here after Port Arthur, Texas, you have more California, more California. And then you have Beaumont, Texas. And here the home prices are slight. They're about almost twice as high as they are in Port Arthur, Texas. But again, when you are looking at these places, I don't want you to automatically assume that because um, it's 
one of the most cost effective places to move to, that it is the best place to move to because it might not be. Uh, and you know what I mean by that is you might be moving to a place that has a really low cost of living and the, uh, the salaries are really, really high, but the crime rate is ridiculously high. And I'll give you an example of that. So uh, let's see. Okay, here, if you look at Vallejo, California, right? Vallejo, California, the crime rate is actually relatively low if you compare it to other cities. It's 18 out of 100, okay, for violent crime. And for property crime, it's 24 out of 100. If you go to Fairfield, it's 40. And But if you go all the way down to Oakland, it's 86.5 for violent crime and 89 for property crime, right? That is one of the highest. So let's say we want to take a look at all of the states. I'm going to uncheck all of these. And I'm going to look at every single state on this list. Now, again, you're going to see that most of them are in California. But here we have Fairbanks, um, Alaska. And here you're actually going to be making $107,000 a year. And your home price is going to be $276,000, right? That means your monthly mortgage payment is going to be $1,795. You're going to be left with about $58,000 a year. Yeah, a year on average after you pay your taxes in your um, and your mortgage payments. And uh, again, you can look at the crime rate on the right side. But let's say, for example, you want to look at something else. Let's say you want to look at homes based on violent crime or uh, home prices. Let, let's look at home prices. If you are interested in real estate, for example, and you are a nurse, right? Um, you could be looking at a location that has low cost homes and then um, you know, you might consider buying homes in that area if you want to invest in those areas, right? And this is this spreadsheet was not meant to be a spreadsheet for people that are interested in buying real estate. But I realized afterwards that it can actually give you some data if you're trying to research locations where you can buy a home. So this is the ascending data, right? So I can change it and look for the lowest ones. Uh, that was descending. This is the ascending, right? So the lowest cost homes are going to be in a state like or a city like Flint, Michigan, Youngstown, Ohio, Danville, Illinois, right? These are the ones that are going to have the homes that cost the least amount. And these, uh, there's over, I believe I got like 580 to 600 cities on this list. Um, but yeah, that's something that's interesting that you guys can take a look at as well. Uh, but let's say you want to take a look at LPN salaries because we got a lot of LPNs on this channel as well. So let's uh, sort this by left over annually and you can see here definitely do not move to sunnyvale santa barbara santa clara carlsbad none of these cities because the home prices are ridiculous there's no way you can even afford that you'll be left with like negative eighty two thousand dollars if you can even manage to buy a house like that or, or get a mortgage approved which is not going to happen obviously uh but yeah you don't want to move there okay let's do descending and now you can see, again, Flint, Michigan is going to be at the top of this list, but who's going to want to live there? Who's going to want to live in Detroit, right? Look at the crime rate in these areas. 94.7 out of 100 for violent crime in Detroit, Michigan. You're definitely not going to want to move, in a, move to a place like that, even if you're going to have you know, additional income in that location, which is still not much. It's $39,000 a year where you could have you know, fifty six to 60000 if you were to live and work somewhere in California. And again, this uh, spreadsheet is based on where you're going to live and work. So you could still choose to live in a very low cost of living area and just commute pretty far to a high paying area, right? So that's that's also an option. All right, so let's see. Oh uh, man, we got a lot of questions. All right, let me go back over there and answer some of the questions. Okay. And you know what? I'm actually going to drag this up so I got I can see you guys right in front of me. Okay, there you go. Um, let's see. What questions do we have? Okay, I answered that one. Good. Okay, perfect. You guys can see that. I answered that one. Okay, is it possible to do a business on the side and per diem nursing job at Kaiser? Makes very good money with my wholesaling real estate. Oh, I make very good money with my wholesaling real estate and just love nursing so much. 
Well, you know, Monica works per diem and I work part time and we're running a business. So it's absolutely possible. I only work five days every two weeks. I'm off nine days in a row. At the moment, I'm actually off 10 days in a row. And I go back to work for four days and then I'm going to be off for 10 days again. So it's absolutely possible. Like you, I don't know if you saw, oh, maybe I can show you guys, but I'm on average, I'm working like less than 20 hours a week. And I'm going to show you guys what that looks like because I, I was really interested in calculating what our income was from our content creation business as well as our income from our, our nursing jobs. So let's see if I can share that screen with you guys and I can show you exactly how much we're making from that. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so I'm going to zoom in so you guys can see that as well. Let's see if I can zoom in some more. 200%. Okay. So um, let me go up to the top. And this is based on how much we earned since 2021, right? Um, and I know it looks like it's all over the place, but let's say in 2021, right over here, right? I earned 43,000. These are, this is based by like in quarters, right? So in 2021 for my W2 job, I earned $151,148. My parental leave, because I was on parental leave that, that year, I actually earned about $12,019. So the total that I made that year was $163,167, right? I worked an average of 1,129 hours that year. So I worked a lot of hours, right? Then came 2022. In 2022, I made 118000 and that's because I dropped my hours to 20 at that point. The entire year, I was working 20 hours a week, right? And then I made, um, eight, I worked 874 hours that year. This year, I'm already at 98. It might be over 100 now. It's probably like 103, 105, because this is uh, outdated by like one pay period. But I'm up to 711 hours for the year. Okay, now, if you look at my average work hours, in 2021, I worked 21.73 hours on average. I made $13,597 per month. These are gross. This is my gross salary, right? Um, then in 2022, I worked 16.81 hours and I made $9,800. This year, the average, as you can see, every year is lower than the last. This year, I'm working an average of 16.16 .16 hours, right? And I'm still getting benefits. And the reason why it's so low is because I I use my sick leave, right? So um, I've used up all of my sick leave for the, the year. And I put out a poll recently that where I asked you guys, what is it that you do to kind of um, get away from feeling burned out? And some people said they, well, a, a lot of people said that they take time off, right? And I'm like that. I need to take time off in order to not be so burned out. Uh, but this year, my average monthly gross is $9,823, right? And then Monica, on the other hand, in 2021, she made from parental leave and from her W-2 job, $138,000. She actually didn't work much that year because she took about four to four and a half, almost five months off while she was on parental leave. Uh, so she worked 934 hours. But then the next year, she made $197,000. She worked 1,415 hours. And then this year, she's already up to, it's probably closer to 146, 147,000, but she has earned $136,000 for the year of 2023, as of like the end of October, right? Then, uh, and you know what? Let me hide this so you guys, uh, let's see, there we go, uh, hide. Okay, so you guys can see it better. Okay, so then um, now let's take a look at this. How many hours did she work? In 2021, she worked an average of 17.97 hours. And that's, again, because she was off for nearly five months that year. And then in 2021, 2022 is the year that she worked the most amount. She worked 27.22 hours. And now I say the most because for us, that's a lot of hours. Like, we think that's a lot of hours. But for you guys, you're probably like, damn, I work like 40 hours a week. I work 60 hours a week. But if we work that many hours, we would never be able to put the time that we do towards the business and our YouTube channel and all of that. Uh, so, and then in addition to that, like we love spending time with each other. Um, you know, the fact that Monica's not here right now, I'm actually missing her in the pot, in the live stream right now. I wish she were here. 
because she would be moderating. Like she helps me out so much. Um, and the reason why I can continue to do this is because she's working all the time when I'm, when I'm working on the business, like the next eight days, she's going to be working eight days in a row. Uh, but again, that still averages out uh, for this year. Uh, let me see if I can show you for this year. It still averages out for her to 21 hours and 52, uh, 21.52 hours for the uh, 2023, right? And her average income this year for the month is $13,664. Now, I want you guys to see what our income from YouTube and, uh, you know, like content creation part of the business looks like. So let me see if I can zoom in more. Actually, no, I can't. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Uh, nope. Okay. All right. Let's leave it like that. Okay. So um, if you can see here in 2021, when we started the channel, we were grossing about $25,000 a month from our W2 jobs combined. And in that year, we only made $681 from YouTube. That's this column right here. We also made $434 from sales on our website. And in total, we made $1,114 for the entire year that year, right? Which is not a lot of money at all, right? So then in 2022, we made uh, 26,000 from our regular jobs. And that was the monthly income, 26,000. And then we made $7,862 from YouTube, just YouTube ads. Then we made $36, which is not much, from affiliates like uh, Fiverr. When I included a link to uh, like a Fiverr Illustrator or a Fiverr Resume Builder, uh, that you know gave us and generated us thirty six dollars. Then from the sales on our website, and um, I can show you what the website looks like, but the sales from our website got us you know three thousand one hundred and seventy five dollars that year for a total of eleven thousand seventy three dollars. And then. Here comes this year. This year we made ten thousand six hundred and ninety-four dollars just from YouTube ads, three hundred and seventy-one from affiliates, ten thousand two hundred and ten dollars from sponsorships. Where the previous years we weren't even earning any money from sponsorships, and then we made six thousand nine hundred and eighty-five dollars from our Wix sales, which is you know consultations that we provide on our website, as well as the spreadsheets like the ones that you saw previously that we sell on our website, and then. Fourth wall is actually a website that allows me to put the spreadsheets on there and link them directly to our YouTube channel. So you guys can see them like right below the video or on an icon next to the video. Uh, so this year, so far, this is as of October, we've earned $28,927. So, um, you know, as you can see, guys, like this is what our monthly income looks like from our content creation business. The first year was only $93 per month. The second year, last year, was $923 per month. This year, we're already at $2,893 per month. That is, um, I mean, it doesn't seem like a lot in the grand scheme of things when you're a nurse, right? But if I were to look at this back when we first started, I would have not really imagined making close to $3,000 a month just from creating videos, right? So I think that's pretty cool. But um, let's see if I can answer some more questions over here. Okay. Hi, I just started working at Kaiser two days ago. Thanks for all of your videos. I'm in the ED in San Francisco and enjoy it. Although the timekeeping system is archaic. <laughs> that is true. We are using like a command uh, prompt type of uh, timekeeping system and everybody hates it in the Kaiser system. Everybody. All right. But welcome to Kaiser. Okay. Next. How difficult, if hired by Kaiser, is it to pick up extra shifts for overtime? Are they abundantly available or restrictive, especially for a new hire? ED, ICU unit, by the way. Well, uh, you know, had I been talking to you at the peak of COVID when they needed nurses left and right, I would have said it's abundantly available. But recently, because they're trying to be very strict with their budget, it's going to be a little bit harder than it used to be. It doesn't mean you can't get overtime because I still have coworkers that get plenty of overtime, even the, the new grads. Um, actually, there was a new grad that just got hired and I saw him working a 12 hour shift. I'm like, wait a minute, why are you here right now? Because he was supposed, he, I think his shift ended at like 7 p.m. And he said that he was staying there for an additional shift. 
So it, they're still offering it. You just got to be, uh, so you sign up for what we call ad hocs, which is a notification system that lets you know when there's a shift available and just be one of the first ones to respond to it. Um, okay, next, let's see. How did you pay off debt and expenses while in nursing school? Well, uh, I didn't. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't pay off any debt because all I was doing was accumulating debt when I was in nursing school. Uh, but, you know, um, I was getting unemployment benefits for a short period of, period of time. And I was living with Monica's mom, my mother-in-law. She was not my mother-in-law at the time, but I was living with her. And, I, and then I went back and forth between living with her and living with my own mother. And um, I actually, this is why I got into nursing school. It's because I was laid off two times before I became a nurse. So I had such a hard time keeping a job because I worked in corporate America and in corporate America, they don't care if you've been an employee with the company for 20 years, 30 years, they'll get rid of you if they feel like you're not contributing to, to their bottom line. And when I got laid off, 50 employees were laid off as well. So I remember going into the office and them telling me, uh, well, as I was walking into the office, I looked at the manager's office and I could see that there was there were like two two people wearing um, suits. And when I looked in their direction, they looked at me and I already knew what was happening. I knew what was going on because I was working for their risk, uh, like uh, risk, uh, risk department. I forgot what it was called. It's basically uh, I was in charge of reviewing merchant applications because let's say you're a company that's looking to make sales on at your storefront and you need to accept credit cards, or well, you will go to a merchant processor so that they can uh, you know, create the process in which you have a, um, a, a payment machine at your establishment, accept the credit card, then that goes through Visa or MasterCard, and then the, the money is processed and deposited into your business checking account. So I was the one in charge of reviewing your business credit, your business history, and I already knew how much money was coming into our company at the time and how much money was coming out because I worked for the risk analyst department. Anyways, so when I came in and I saw them and I, I already knew I was going to get laid off. I had been telling my coworkers we were all going to get laid off and I told them to be ready. They didn't believe me. So when I walked in there and I walked into the office, I said, I don't need to hear it. Do I have a severance package? That's all I need to hear. And I'll be out of your way. They told me there was no severance package. I couldn't believe it. No severance package. So they told me I had to file for unemployment at the time. And I did. That's what I had to do. I, I went to, I remember I was walking. I walked all the way to Central Park and I was all the way downtown, right? If anybody who lives in New York knows where downtown is compared to Central Park, you would know it takes hours just to walk up there. But I walked to Central Park and when I got there, I just sat there and I thought like, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I working for a company or for an industry that just doesn't value their employees? And at that moment, that's when I decided that I was going to be a nurse because I knew that as a nurse, you have security. And you got to think about it like this too. If you have a family, you can't keep, th you can't keep uh, thinking that you might just lose your job at any moment. And then you won't have any money to provide for your family. And that's all I was thinking about. I just wanted to be able to support my family. And that's why I became a nurse. So, you know, I made a video talking about that. The reason why I became a nurse was for the money. It's, it's absolutely true. And I know some people don't want to hear that, but it's true. Um, okay. So uh, what I did was, like I said, I lived with my mother-in-law. I lived with my mom. And this was only like, this was like towards the end of uh, uh, like nursing school where I didn't have unemployment benefits. So the unemployment benefits lasted me almost all the way through nursing school. And then by the time I graduated, I was obviously able to get a job like immediately because I was friends with one of the managers that was a clinical instructor of mine. And she was a manager at the hospital that I worked in. So she got me a job right away. Okay. All right. So let's see. Is it the norm for Kaiser to hire um, RNs with one year of experience coming out of state? Absolutely. If you have at least one year of experience, you're going to get hired at Kaiser. That's that's definitely, yeah, it'll happen. Okay. I am planning to move from Chicago to Sacramento. I am an ORRN uh, or OR nurse for 10 years and with tele experience as well. I want to know what are the pre-tax deductions in terms of taxes and benefits. Uh, pre-tax deductions, um, man, there's so many. Uh, 401k, uh, 
the there's going to be an after tax one which is the roth ira so after you get paid you can contribute to that but when you pull money out it's going to be tax free so you can consider that uh, another thing is fsa federal savings account i forgot what the limit is on that i believe it's like 2750 per year or something close to that but um yeah that can lower your tax liability at the end of the year because it's uh tax you know it's uh, pre-tax there's also a dependent savings account and that's similar to an fsa but it's just for like child care preschool for your kids that type of stuff also i believe you can use it for your parents so if your parents are in a nursing home or you have to support them that can be used towards that as well uh there's some hospitals are offering um you know like health savings accounts and you can consider that uh, but honestly if you're an employee there aren't that many pre-tax or tax deductions that you can uh, benefit from, which is why I always say you should be an employer. Even if you're an employee, start a business. Even if you start something where like it's just a hobby of yours, but register it as a business with the intention of actually earning income from this, this, this business or this hobby so that you can then write things off and you can hopefully build it to a point where it'll lead to so much income that you can quit your job. Okay, All right, let's go on to the next one. I'm also an OR nurse currently in New York City, currently at $65 an hour. Uh, Meng, what hospital do you work in? I recently uh, looked at the Mount Sinai salaries and I did notice that the income has gone up in New York City, which is great. So you guys are getting paid a lot more than I used to get paid when I worked there, but it's still not at the level uh, of like, Northern California. And I know San Diego is paying somewhere around that as well, right? So it's a decent wage. It's a decent hourly rate, but your cost of living is just so much higher than it is in like certain parts of California and even like Hughes, like uh, Texas and many other places, right? Okay. Does Kaiser hire psychiatric nurses? It's extremely rare, um, you know, and most of our psych patients are actually transferred out to outpatient psych facilities. So it's going to be very difficult for you to find any job at Kaiser for psych nurses. All right. Uh, thank you. Good. Okay. Do you have a spreadsheet for pharmacists? Okay. Let's see. I'm going to show you that. Um, I'm going to share this. Uh, healthcare salaries and share. Okay. So uh, if you click here, you're going to see that it also says, oh man, I thought I included it in here. Huh. You know what? I'm going to go back and see if I can add it on there because I did think that I included it. Um, but no, apparently not. Uh, it's not in there. I'm going to see if I can, because I know I have that data. So I'm going to go back and include it. And I will let you know in the comments section uh, when I do include it. Okay. All right. Let me stop sharing this. Okay. Uh, let's see. What else we got? Uh, perfect. Okay. Is there a lot of jobs for pediatric nurses in Northern uh, California? My fiance and I are planning to move to California. She's MCURN and I'm a step down PDRN. We both work in Connecticut. Yeah. Uh, there are jobs for pediatric nurses in California. I mean, a lot of jobs. So it's, it would be fairly easy for your wife to find a job out here. So yeah, just you, you guys should definitely just apply. But I would say, you know what, to just play it safe, have her apply. Um, and if she gets the job, then at that point, maybe you can start applying or you both just apply at the same time. Honestly, it doesn't matter because eventually whoever gets the job first can support the other, right? And um, once you guys are out here, then just continue, the other can continue applying for jobs and eventually we'll get one. Because when we first moved out here, it was only me that was working. Monica had not gotten a job offer yet. So three months later is when she actually got a job offer. Okay. And uh, yeah, it's possible though it, on, on one person's income to survive out here. Okay. Yes. Those places in Texas are dumps. Absolutely. That's what I was saying. Um, but that's the good thing about the salary uh, spreadsheet again, is that it gives you an idea of what some of the places may look like 
um, based on you know how much money you're going to be bringing in, how much money you're going to have left over. And then you need to do your due diligence to find out if those places are attractive to you. All right. So it's not just about like how much money you're going to be bringing home. And I constantly tell people this. All right. Let's see what's next. All right. Are you getting your ADN? How would you know if, uh, oh, after you get, after you get your ADN, how would you know if a job will pay for your BSN? How does that process work? Well, for the most part, if you're working for a hospital that has a union, they're going to have tuition reimbursement. Like that's what unions work into the contract almost in every single union hospital that I've ever heard of. Another thing you should look at are teaching hospitals. So if a hospital has a university tied to it, they're going to very likely offer tuition reimbursement. And most of the time is tuition reimbursement in the, in the same um, universities that the hospital system is attached to. So I remember when I worked at New York Presbyterian, the name of the hospital was Columbia University, New York Presbyterian. And when I worked there, they provided tuition reimbursement for um, actually for nurses going to any kind of university, any school, but um, there was a special agreement between Columbia University, the, the university itself, and the hospital that I worked for. All right. Let's see. My dad was the pharmacist technician in Providence a long time ago, um, and that's where the money's at. <laughs> there you go. Okay. What certifications look really good on an application to a NorCal hospital? You know, um, it, it depends what position you're applying to. Because if you're applying to something like the ED, then uh, trauma certification, um, you know, uh, the ENA, like if you get your ENA certification, uh, or sorry, uh, CEN, which is a certified emergency nurse certification, that one is important and, and will be recognized when you apply for a job. So if you're a pediatric nurse, you know, you can do the pediatric uh, emergency nurse uh, certification. Or if you work NICU, you do the NICU certification. Whatever the department you're looking to work in, there's a certification for it, an advanced certification. And if you wanted to apply for it, you you could. But honestly, I would say you should have experience in that area before you even take the test because that those tests are extremely hard and in many cases, even harder than the NCLEX. All right, let's see, next. Do you have any experience in psych nursing or like that area? I do not. The most experience I would say in psych nursing is just working in the ED with psych patients, and that's about it. I have friends that work in psych, and one of them in particular actually considered moving to California until he realized that it would be so difficult for him to find a high-paying job here as a psych nurse. My aunt works as a... Um, was that as an RN at correctional office um, in Stockton and makes around $90 an hour. Yep. Stockton is one of the higher paying areas as well. Okay. If not possible to get a job in Kaiser Roseville, do you have any suggestions which other facility where nurses can have a better opportunity in Roseville, California? Yeah. Sutter Roseville. That's where I worked before I came over here, before I came to Kaiser. In Sutter Roseville, like I mentioned in the previous videos, was an awesome place to work at. Like I loved it. It's actually one of the hospitals that has the highest nurse satisfaction scores. So look into working at Sutter as well as um, you can work at Dignity, any of the Dignity hospitals out there. But you know what? Even if you don't work in Roseville, you could work in Sacramento and it's like 20 minutes away, 25 minutes away. So it's really not that far. Okay. How is the pay for pharmacists in California? I'm trying to convince my wife to move with me uh, so uh, to California so we don't have to work as much. Huh, let me see if I can find the contract for that. I think I have it here somewhere. Uh, let's see, pharmacists. Um, and if I, and, but you know what, from my memory, it's about um, 90, they, they can make up to like $90 an hour or something like that. It's, it's pretty decent, but I don't know compared to where you live, how much higher it's gonna be. So it's comparable to what the nurses make, not as much because I think it caps off at like $95 to $98 an hour, but it's still pretty high. All right, let's go on to the next one. Wow, Kaiser pays that well. I'd have to work around 2,500 hours to make that much. That's crazy.
crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I tell you guys. And again, you can find an apartment, a two bedroom, one bathroom apartment in Sacramento for rent for $1,750. And it's not like a flimsy looking apartment either. You can find a decent apartment for $1,750. You know, you're more likely to find a better one though if you pay like at least $2,000 to $2,500 a month. But regardless, you're still able to find something decent here. All right. I appreciate the gems on becoming a nurse. Keep up the good work. Cool. Thank you. What is your weekly take-home pay? Huh. My weekly take-home pay is about $3,000 right now. And that's with me not working any overtime at all. Oh, sorry. That's actually bi-weekly. So my weekly is $1,500, working 20 hours a week. And Monica, she brings an average of, I would say, like, between four thousand and five thousand dollars every two weeks, or two thousand to twenty five hundred every week. Okay. Next, let's see. I love this channel. Our goal is to move to NorCal in the next two years. It keeps me going. Thanks, man. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Any foreign nurses here? Your videos are very informative and ed educational. There's actually a lot of foreign nurses that watch our videos. There's uh, Canadian nurses. There's nurses from the Philippines, from African countries. They're from all over the place. Okay, I really appre appreciate the information you share in your videos. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's hard looking for per diem as a full-time OR nurse. I am looking for one, but most hospitals are hiring per diems who don't have full-time jobs in other hospitals. Huh, that's interesting. Um, you know, it's weird because uh, when you work per diem, especially if you're working per diem at the Kaiser system, they don't really care how many hours you work as long as you just pick up the minimum. And many of the hospitals are like that. So I think there's something else behind you not being able to get a job. There must be something else going on. Um, you should be able to get a job because I know nurses who work in other facilities and are per diem at Kaiser. So it's absolutely possible. And I know nurses who work part-time at Kaiser and also work per diem at Sutter. So um, yeah, you, you can totally do it. And don't be in a hurry. Again, don't, you know, take your time. We've got time, right? Take your time. Don't be in a hurry and you'll get one eventually. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Let's see. Sorry, maybe late, but how long does it take to get vested and how many years do you have to work before getting full retirement and health benefits as a Kaiser RN? Okay, um, so I you can go back when the video is over, but uh, replay it. Uh, you have to be working for Kaiser for at least five years in order to get vested. And I mentioned it before. That means that if you are vested and you leave your you leave the job, you can cash out your balance, but you have to pay taxes on it. Um, Another thing I should mention, there might be penalties, but you have to cash, uh, uh, you have to pay taxes for sure. If you've been working with Kaiser, I believe, don't quote me on this, I got to go back to it, it's about uh, 15 years, you have to work for them for about 15 years, and you have to have at least, uh, you have to be at least 65 years of age or older in order for you to get full retirement benefits through your pension, right? So that's to be fully vested and to get full um, your, your, the full balance on your pension. Now, when it comes to health benefits, that's another story because, um, nurses in the previous contract negotiations were trying to fight to retain their health insurance benefits through Kaiser and several other things. There was, there were so many things included in that, that we didn't get. So that one might be kind of difficult to, um, you, you shouldn't rely on that one. If you're planning to retire from Kaiser. I would say what you need to do and what I tell everybody to do is that you need to invest your money um, because by the time you retire, if you have so much money invested, you don't have to worry about a pension and you don't have to worry about health insurance. And when I say invest, at least do the 401k and contribute to your Roth IRA if you can as well, but then also invest in like a taxable brokerage account, invest in real estate ultimately because the the thing that the wealthy do once they become wealthy and many on the path to become wealth becoming wealthy is that they invest in real estate because that protects their assets right so if you lose let's say you lose all of the money in your 401k because the market collapses completely there's a depression 
homes are still going to be there. They, they they might not hold all of their value, but people are still going to want to need homes to live in. You know, um, you you would have still had equity in that home, uh, maybe not as much, uh, but there's still some value to the property that you own. Whereas you know, stocks might not be the same way, right? Uh, okay, let's go to the next one. Derek, why are you telling them that you work in another hospital? Well, yeah, so that's that's true. Um, but you know, they can find out because if you're applying for Kaiser, they will ask you for your employment history. You need to provide uh, them with proof of your income history. And that includes, uh, you, you might have to actually uh, submit pay stubs in order to prove how much you've earned or W-2s actually. So even though he's saying that, um, he, he has to say, he might have to say. It. So I don't fault him for it. He has to be honest because they might still be able to find that out. Uh, okay, let's see what's next. Okay, when y'all visiting New York again? Well, we're gonna be there soon, within the next few weeks or so. Um, but man, we've got so many things planned in our, our itinerary. Monica's birthday is actually going to be this coming this month. So we're going to celebrate her birthday there. We're going to celebrate Thanksgiving over there. And we're also, we have a plan uh, for a video that we want to shoot, which includes, uh, so I mentioned to you guys that I grew up in the projects, right? So I want to go back and show you guys where I grew up so you can see, you know, how we grew, how, what it took for us to get to where we are today because it wasn't an easy road and Monica's wasn't easy either. Uh, she lived in one of the ghettoest areas in New York City. And uh, we're hoping that we can record and document the path that it took for us to get to where we are because we want to show you guys that it doesn't matter where you are in life right now, anyone can be a nurse. You just got to put your mind towards it. Right. So that's what we're hoping to do when we go to New York. But we have so many different uh, plans that we want to do and we want to meet up with family and friends. So hopefully we can fit all of that into our itinerary. All right. OK. Uh, yeah. He has to tell them the schedule. Yeah, that's true. OK. What's the work environment like between Kaiser ORs and UC Davis? Well, Kaiser OR, uh, let's see the work environment. UC Davis employees are pretty happy where they work, but I don't know what their OR is, is like. So you might have to ask someone in the comment section. I do know that Kaiser is a different ballgame. I can't really talk about all the negative things about Kaiser because, you know, I need to keep my job. But uh, there's things to like and dislike about any job you work in. And it's really, at the end of the day, your experience might be different than somebody else's experience, right? So you might apply for a job and you might absolutely love working there, but you might have an, a coworker who has hated working there so much that they, they every day that they come in, they're miserable, always telling you that they're going to leave. So everybody's going to have a different experience, right? He's right. Corporate America doesn't care. When you start to make a little more than a newbie, they put you they put you in the pressure cooker and then refer you to the chopping block. That's true. I'm telling you guys, before I became a nurse, I was all over corporate America and every job was like that. Okay. If you had the exact amount of money in your retirement, the 403B, that you owed on your student loans, would you withdraw them to pay off your student loan? I personally would not. I would not do that because... I always look at my retirement account as my, uh, it, it's there to protect me in the case that, you know, my investments and my business fail when I reach retirement age. So I would never, in my opinion, me personally, I would never pull it out. What I would do is I would cut back on certain expenses. Uh, when COVID first got to, this, uh, to the U.S., and we weren't able to travel, I think that was the best time. And it was a catalyst for me and Monica to be able to pay off our debt because we could not travel. We could not go out and eat. So we were home all the time. It was the most amount of time we've ever spent at home. So during that time, we saved everything we possibly could. We didn't eat out, we didn't travel. 
And then all of the income we earned, we just threw it away into our student loans and our all of our debt, the car debt that we had and a $70,000 loan that we borrowed just to pay uh, for the down payment on the house. So I would not do it if I were you. I know there's some people that they're, they're willing to pay the penalties uh, or or take out a loan on it, but I wouldn't. Okay. And you know what, guys? Um, I said the other day that I think I was coming up with a cold, but honestly, I'm allergic to our cats and we have cats here. But I had to get like um, some type of nasal passage surgery. Uh, they had to like shear some of the um, turbinates in my nasal passages because my nose would get stuffed. And this was like two years ago. It was like two and a half years ago when our son was born. And I haven't had any issues since then. But two weeks ago, or almost three weeks ago, I've been having like congestion. And I'm wondering if it's related to my allergies that I have for the cats, because it's not going away. And my daughter loves our cats so much, which is why we haven't gotten rid of them. And, and don't get me wrong, I love cats, but if I have allergies to them, which is like apparently from the allergy testing that I got done, they are severe allergies. And we still have these cats. We even used to foster kittens. Like I remember coming home one time um, and I told my, well, actually I told Monica that they had approved uh, the fostering of like five or six kittens. So we brought them home and we surprised our daughter with these kittens. They were like the most, the cutest little things, but I'm, I didn't know I was allergic to them. So now like, I'm just like so allergic to them and I wish we could get rid of them because I can't breathe. I can't breathe at night. I can't breathe throughout the day. It's just terrible. I don't know if you guys are allergic to any pets, but those of you that are, you probably understand where I'm coming from. All right. Okay. So just make sure the other job isn't in the same hospital system. Yeah, that's true also. Uh, let's see. If you also have a 529, that's a solid. Oh, I forgot to mention that. That's absolutely true. Yeah. And also, um, now there's a new policy in place that they try. I, I believe it's going to take effect in 2024. If you have a 529 plan and it's been active for 15 years, don't quote me on it, but it's about 15 years then you can actually roll it over into an IRA. You would not have been able to do this previously. Back that uh, before you could only use it for like educational purposes, like student loans and things like that, or student tuition. But if you, if you start now within 15 years, so like, let's say you're gonna have a baby, think about putting money into your 529 as soon as possible. So by the time they reach 18, if they choose to something do something unrelated to school, you can just roll it over into an IRA. All right. Um, next. At least here in New York. Yep. Okay. As a per diem, they ask about my availability, and I have to tell them I am only available once a week. Okay. Okay, that's fine. What's wrong? With that? <laughs> can you be hired in in a uh, Can you be hired in Kaiser? I'm a BSN graduate, RN in the Philippines. Uh, has new California RN and Philippines RN experience for three years. Thanks. Uh, you know what? I would actually, I wish you could just hop on this call right now because I would love to talk to you about your journey from, you know, the Philippines to California. That would be amazing. If you're in the comments section, let me know. I'll give you a link. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, it's, so getting a job at Kaiser if, if you're a foreigner, is going to be very tricky because it's going to depend on the recruiter, the hiring manager. It's, there's so many variables involved, and every manager, every recruiter is going to be the recruiter is going to be different. But um, I need to know how much experience you have in California, not just in the Philippines, uh, because you said you have a new California RN license. So I'm guessing you don't have experience in California. So um you typically if you're working in a location like canada or the uk it's it's not that difficult to get a job here in the u.s especially def, even california because the hospital system or the the type of care that they receive in those countries is very similar but when you're comparing us to the philippines then it's going to be very dependent probably on the hospital that you've worked in in the philippines okay uh, my wife and I just did that. Okay. I currently work at a hospital. For, oh, hospital for special surgeries. I love that hospital. One of my favorites. I live with roommates currently, which helps keep costs down. 
I have five years of OR experience, and I used to work at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Those are great hospitals, by the way. Yeah, no wonder. So hospital for special surgeries is actually one of the highest paying hospitals in all of New York City. And for those of you that live in New York, you should know this, right? Um, when Monica and I were considering moving back to New York, and we still are, um, but we might not work there as nurses anymore, but if we ever do, Monica has considered working at Hospital for Special Surgery because the pay is so high. All right. How do you find out which hospitals are unionized before applying? Uh, you know, that's, oh, that's easy. So um, let I'm, I'm going to show you. I'm going to share the screen with you. Okay. So let's say um, also, okay, I, I need to open up a new tab. Hold on a second. Uh, where is it? Here? Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to share the screen so you guys, so you can see. Uh, new tab. Where's my new tab? Uh, here it is. Okay. Okay, so let's say uh, I'm going to search um, hospitals, hospitals in New York City with, with unions. Okay. You can do a search like this, right? And then here, this is the first link over here. This first link is going to show you NISNA represented facilities. So you just choose or search for the city that you're looking to work in, and then you can find out what unions represent which hospitals in the cities that you're looking to work in. So that is, is that simple, right? And these are all of the hospitals that NICE now represents in New York State, right? So, yeah, that's how you do it. All right, let's go back. Okay, next. Any place you know hiring weekend per diem? Oh, man, that's, that's, uh, no, that's a tough one. It's, first of all, many hospitals are really not even hiring per diem. Well, I wouldn't say many, but it's very difficult to find a per diem position in any hospital because most of them are going away to the internal applicants first. So what I would say is just keep applying to the highest paid hospitals in your area um, and you know just hope for the best. And you can follow the steps that I've mentioned in the previous videos. You know, I, I keep saying it in every video, but reach out to the managers that work in the departments you're looking to apply to. Uh, you know, reach out to any friends or colleagues that you have that might be working in the hospitals that you're looking to apply to. Reach out to um, people in Facebook groups. Ask them if they know if there's anybody hiring in the places that you want to work in. You can also go on, um, let's see, Incredible Health. Uh, you, I have the link in the description of this video. They're not sponsoring this video, but I always put it in the videos because I always get raving re reviews from people who I've consulted in the past who have told me they've been able to get two, three, four job offers through Incredible Health after applying through there or putting in their um, their, their profile through there. And uh, man, there's just so many ways I made a video about it. So uh, you probably already know all of the ways. Just keep doing that. Is there a dialysis? Uh, is there dialysis opening in Roseville in Sacramento? Yeah, I I know plenty of dialysis nurses that work out here. Their pay is something like 60, I believe like 60, $65 an hour. So it's not that bad. Um, and they really, one cool thing that I heard from one of my coworkers who has family that works in dialysis is that the way their schedule works is, let's say you get paid $60 an hour and you're at a, a pit, like in a hospital, you're providing dialysis to a, a patient in the hospital or um, yeah, usually it's like for these, dialysis nurses that are going from location to location, they're getting paid from the moment they leave their house to the moment they get back home. So that might consist of, let's say, you having to get uh, coffee or something before you go to a patient's uh, destination. Um, and then while you're taking care of the patient and then on the way back home, maybe you need to get something to eat and then finally you get home. You get paid the entire time. The, the entire time. So that's what's cool about being a dialysis nurse. Okay. I'm from the Philippines, been here since 2019. That is awesome. Okay. I'm watching from Barbados. What? <laughs> That's what's up. <laughs> okay. This channel is really helpful, especially for us foreign nurses. Thank you. Okay. 
I am nursing student at a local nursing school in Sacramento, wondering how precepting at Kaiser impacts the chances of working there. You have a higher chance because um, your clinical, uh, your preceptor might put in a good word for you. And trust me, I know this from experience because uh, I've seen, like I work with some of my coworkers who have referred our students to our managers and they've been able to get work. So just make sure you do the best job you possibly can, go above and beyond, and you will likely be one of those that gets hired as a new grad in the Kaiser system. Okay, my wife and I just got a job in the NICU at Kaiser in Santa Clara. Do you have a recommendation of where to live? It's pretty pricey from what I can see. Yeah, Santa Clara is extremely pricey. Let me see if I can find something for you. I'm gonna let's just do a search together. All right. Let's let's look this up together. Hold on a second. Share my screen. I'm gonna share a new tab and we're gonna go to Zillow together. Okay. So Zillow.com. This is one of my favorite sites. So let's say you're in Santa, uh, Santa Clara, California. And I hope you guys can see this, but okay. So, uh, all right, this is me just searching for homes that are at, le at least between 500,000 and a million, but let's say you want to go under $900,000. Okay. These are homes that are for sale. I'm going to remove this boundary and there you go. Okay. Price. Uh, let's do, yeah, let's keep it at low to high. But let's look for bedrooms. We want more than this. Let's see, two bedrooms, two bathrooms at least. Well, let's go for three. All right. Okay, so this is Lakewood. Huh. Let me look at the different locations. Uh, San Jose. The closer you get to San Jose, the better it will be, honestly. But uh, let's see. Yeah, you might have to be looking in this area over here um let's see somewhere around here uh yeah you definitely don't want to live there uh let's see you know what <sighs> yeah honestly it might have to be something like this uh it's 1200 square feet three bed two bath six hundred and fifty nine thousand. but the unfortunate thing is that something like this is going to cost you five thousand dollars a month monica and i paid Six hundred and ninety-seven thousand for our house. This was back in twenty seventeen, uh, twenty eighteen. Sorry, and when we bought it, uh, we secured it at like a, th a four point three five percent interest rate. Then we refinanced in twenty twenty one, I believe it was, and we got our rate down to three point three percent. So after we got our rate down, it, our monthly payments is like four thousand dollars a month. So you're going to be paying a thousand dollars more per month for a house that costs less than our house which is unfortunate and that's you, there's no way around that because the interest rates right so hopefully after you get the house the interest rates will go down and you can refinance but let's see something that i look at often is the school districts so as you can see here there's three out of ten three out of ten right that means that the school districts aren't that great if you're looking to have children in that area and also Think about how many days a house like this has been on Zillow. This was been there for 55 days. So you probably don't want to live in a location where that house has been listed for 55 days, because if nobody's been purchasing, has not purchased it in that amount of time, that means there's something wrong with the location or the house, right? Um, so yeah, you might have to commute far. This is why I always tell people not to move to a place where the cost of living is high and then look for a job there. What you should do is look for a job in a place that has a low cost of living and then move there, right? Because after you get the job, then you can move. And also, um, one thing that I tell everybody is before you even move to California, you should take a look at the different areas that you're interested in moving to, because you won't really understand what it feels like to live in those locations until you're actually there visiting the locations. Okay, is there dialysis opening at Kaiser? No, there's not. Okay, let's see. 
Unfortunately, if you work full time and you want to work as per diem in other facilities, you will end up paying more taxes at the end of the filing year. At the end of the year, you owe more money to the IRS. That's not 100% true. So remember, we have what's called um, a, a progressive tax system, and we have a marginal tax rate. So uh, let me see if I can go over that so I can show you guys what I mean by that. Uh, let's see. Okay open up a tab here okay so a lot of people assume that because they make more money that they're gonna and they're gonna end up paying more taxes and have less money at the end of the year which is is not true guys that's not how the tax system works so let's take a look at this and I can show you what I mean by that um, tax tax bracket okay if this loads okay here we go Okay, so like, let's say you're working at one facility and you're single. You're working at one facility and you're making, let's say, fifty thousand dollars. No, let's say, let's go higher than that, right? Let's say you're working at one facility and you're making a hundred thousand dollars, and then you work at another facility and you're making fifty thousand dollars. Well, the way that the marginal tax rates work is that you would first you, you would have your between the zero zero dollars and the eleven thousand dollars of your income would be taxed at 10%. Then between 11,000 and 44,000, you that portion of your income would be taxed at 12% and so on and so forth until you reach this tax bracket. So anything you make between 95,000 and 182,000 regardless of how many jobs you have will be paid at 20, well you will be paying 24% of your income towards that. Right? So you're not going to be paying the whole 24% for the entirety of the $150,000 that you earn. It's only for a portion of that. So I hope that makes sense for you guys. All right. Um, let's see. I'm going to end this one. All right. Let's go on to the next one. Is there dialysis opening? Okay. I mentioned that one already. Okay. Are pension and retirement healthcare benefits grandfathered in? because of the year you are hired if the union contract changes later. See, that's that that's going to be a tricky one because there's been um like contracts in the past where Kaiser changed things around and some things weren't grandfathered in. So, that's why I always tell you guys do not rely on a pension, don't rely on a health insurance from your employer. At the end of the day, you need to invest in yourself don't expect the company that you're working for to invest in you because it might not pan out right okay in school to be an np uh, but wondering what's a good city to work in for that i enjoy california wisconsin minnesota hawaii colorado and arizona any suggestions okay let's see i'm gonna pull up the spreadsheet again and i can show you um salaries okay share this with you Hold on, share my screen. Okay, um, share, salaries, here we go. Okay, I hope you can see that, but you said you wanna look at, let's see, um, Wisconsin. Okay, so I'm gonna select it from my list over here. Let's go in order. California, right here. And then we have uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Hawaii, Colorado. So Colorado right here. Hawaii, Wisconsin, oh, and uh, Minnesota, and let's see, where's Minnesota, where are you, where are you, Minnesota, where's Michigan, you, oh, no, that's Maine, where's Minnesota, okay, guys, hold on a second. okay it's in there somewhere and and oh there it is sorry okay and then uh we have you said arizona too all right so let, let's look at all of those as an rn you're going to select rn from the list and then i hope you guys can see this let me zoom in so you can see it a little bit better oh well, that's too zoomed in 100 percent uh 125 percent okay that's a little bit better all right so again you guys like I always tell you, 
California cities are going to be the highest paying. So let's just keep going down the list. Wisconsin, Bloomington, Wisconsin. Now, um, again, you have to do your research and really dive deep and look at what the city has to offer besides just being a low cost of living city and having a high pay, right? Um, let me do this. Okay. Uh, but then we have, uh, let's keep going down the list. We have Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Here, home prices are 185 and your median salary is 80,000. You're left with 46,000, right? Which is not bad. That is not bad at all. Uh, then we have Arizona, Douglas, Arizona, uh, where the income is 77,000, home prices are 134,000. Okay? And again, you can look at the crime rate on the right-hand side to see how high the crime rate is. Then um, we can keep going down the list, but uh, you'll see that Wisconsin and Arizona seem to be the best choices besides California. And then you have St. Cloud, Minnesota, but yeah, there's a lot of Wisconsin in there. So you could consider that. Um, yeah, let's go back. Okay. Okay, thanks, I'll check. I've been an ER nurse for 10 years. What would be a realistic hourly rate for me at Kaiser or UC Davis? Okay, so um, let's look at that spreadsheet. Unfortunately, I need to update it because um, the, you, so let me show you the contract that I have, right? So they just recently updated their contract within the UC system. And I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, where is it here? I believe, um, one second guys, I'm looking for it. Uh, I think this is it. Yeah. So this is, uh, what they have now. So let's look at the UC system. Um, it's all the way at the top. And I'll zoom in for you guys so you guys can see it, but I'm, let me just scroll to the top so I can find it first. Okay, UC Irvine, UC Davis. Here we got UC Davis. And UC Davis has, let's see, 2023. Okay, 2023. You'll see that UC Davis, you're going to be making, let's say, um, around, oh, this is nurse practitioner. Okay, right here. All right, let me zoom in. Um, if I can find the button to zoom in, maybe this one. Okay. I hope you can see this. All right. So um, if you are, oh, this is for help, home health nurse. Okay, clinical nurse. As of 2023, you will start off at $66 an hour if you have just one year of experience, right? But if you work your way up, you're going to see here, uh, let's see, you're going to be making about $76.82 per hour with like, let's say nine years of experience, right? And that's as a clinical nurse too. And that's not including the differential. So 76.82. And then if you work, uh, let's say evening shift, that's going to be about $82, right? But um, what I was trying to say is that I have this in the spreadsheet, but I haven't updated the numbers correctly. So I'm going to show you what the spreadsheet looks like. But it's um, the Kaiser numbers are correct, but the UC system numbers besides UCSF are going to be slightly off, if not almost like really off. Okay, so but let's let's take a look at it. Okay, so here we go. Okay, and let me make this smaller. Okay, All right. So let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Um, view zoom full screen okay and make this larger i hope you guys can see that okay so if you have um i believe you said let me just go back and <laughs> and show your comments once again nope that's not it this one right here okay i've been an er nurse for 10 years what would be a real realistic hourly rate for me at kaiser or uc davis so 10 years let's do 10 over here and let's say the base rate would be uh, UC Davis. Again, I have to update this. It might be off by a few dollars, but um, let's say 
yeah, actually, I showed you what it is. It's like um, seventy-six dollars or something like that. Uh, but then you have Kaiser North. This is accurate. It's ninety-two dollars and sixty-three cents per hour, if you have ten years of experience, right? So um, if you decide to work evening shift, Kaiser at Kaiser North, you're going to be making a hundred and one dollars per hour. And again, I need to update this. It's going to be somewhere around like eighty-two, eighty-three dollars an hour. And then if you have night sh if you're working night shift, you're going to be making $106 per hour if you're working at Kaiser. But guys, like look at these numbers below that. That's insane. So if you work, um, let me see if I can show you. Guys. If you work at, you know, El Camino, UCSF and Stanford, and Washington Hospital, those hospitals are paying anywhere from $110 an hour to $123 an hour if you're a staff nurse working a night shift with 10 years of experience. That's how crazy high these numbers are over here. And But the reason why, you know, I always say don't move to a place or work at a place that has a high cost of living is because these hospitals like Stanford, UCSF, El Camino, and Washington Hospital are attached to those locations. If you want to live in a low cost of living area, you're going to have to commute away from the Bay Area because that's where most of those places are lo located. Whereas if you're working in Kaiser, the Kaiser North system, all the way from San Francisco, all the way to Fresno, you can work at any of those hospitals and you will still have a high, high paying, a, a high paying job. And you can move to a location that's a low paying location. I mean, sorry, a low cost of living location, right? Then let's see. Uh, all right, next question. What's the most difficult part of your job and what were challenges you faced when you first started? The most difficult part? Well, you know, I have um, 10 years, 11 years of experience. So I don't consider my job to be difficult. What I do consider it to be is, yeah, it may be challenging at times because the amount of work can feel overwhelming at times. Uh, because you're seeing so many patients, I work in the ER, so I'm seeing so many patients every single day that I come into work that my body doesn't stop moving the entire shift. Like I can barely sit down during my shift because it's so busy. So it can take a toll on you physically, uh, you know, because of that. But when I was a new grad, the most difficult part of my job was not being like, I felt like every day that I was coming into work was going to be the day that I would lose my license every single day because I thought that my patient, I would have like a serious med error, that I would uh, just be completely negligent and, and forget to do something for my patient and my patient would die as a result. And that was always going through my mind or that I would upset a family member so much with the care that I provided because it wasn't up to their standards. So I was afraid that the family member would end up reporting me. Not that I was a bad nurse. It's just that I was always, I always did everything that I could to make sure that the patient was the most satisfied with the treatment that I provided. But you never know. And when I was a new grad, those were thoughts that were constantly going through my mind. And it scared the crap out of me. I remember going to, I remember going home and always thinking, oh man, those family members are going to be so upset. I know they must have reported me to my manager. I know I'm going to lose my job. This is it. Like, I'm not going to have a job after today. Or um, coming home and forgetting, not remembering if you counted the medication properly, if you gave it at the right time, or if you, because you know, when you give meds in the hospital, you have a one, uh, you have one hour before and up to one hour before and one hour after to administer the medication. And I remember sometimes I would be like five minutes later than that one hour. So like an hour and five minutes late. And I'd be like, oh man, I'm going to lose my job. This is it. This is the last day I'm going to work. So things like that, you know, are always going to be running through someone who's a new grad's mind. Uh, and it's something that I laugh at now because you're not going to get fired in most places for doing that because nurses are overworked to begin with. So they, you know, most places are going to be very understanding. If you're a new grad, they're going to be very understanding. They know that it's going to take you time to learn. 
Uh, I remember there was one time I was working at one hospital and I had a coworker who was a new grad and he was just off orientation. And I remember him having a patient who was in an isolation room. And when he went into the room, he assessed the patient and then he came out of the room and he was like, um, Jason, can you, uh, can you go check on my patient real quick? I think something's wrong with my patient. So I go into the room and as I'm walking into the room, the patient's a vented patient. And, you know, I don't think much of it at first until I look at the patient's chest and I see that the patient has what, you know, I don't know if you know what crepitus is, but it's like, um, first of all, the chest was like extremely, it like, it was bulging, right? It looked like this person, this patient's chest was going to pop out of their ribs. And then I looked at it and I'm tapping and there's nothing but air. And I'm like, holy crap. It, it must have taken a long time for this nurse to realize that there must have been an issue with the the tube, the, um, the tube that is because she had a trach at the time. There must have been an issue where the vent was pushing the air into the lungs or not into the lungs, but uh, there must have been a puncture or something that might have caused that. Um, and he didn't realize it. So thankfully, we responded early enough that the patient lived, but things like that can happen and it scares every new grad. And he wasn't, you know, they didn't fault him for it or anything uh, because he was doing his hourly rounds on the patient. So that that's kind of what did save him. But, you know, things like that are always going to scare somebody, especially new grads. All right. I love your channel. Currently a circulating nurse for 10 years with 12 years of, as a PICU nurse, PCU nurse. Planning to apply as a tele nurse if there is no RO, OR opening. Latest work experience is necessary. Yeah, you know, they most places prefer anywhere from six months to two years of recent experience. So, um, yeah, when you apply, you need to consider that. But, again, just apply. This, that's just like a recommendation. It doesn't mean that it's it's like written in stone. They might waive that recommendation and, and just hire you anyway based on your other qualities. Okay. UK is different from the US system. Yeah, that's very true. Like the... Um, the terminology that you guys use is completely different. There's a lot of things that are different, like the healthcare system overall is completely different. But what I mean is um, the quality is up to par, it's like up there with the US system. That's what I mean. So, and yeah, it's not like apples to oranges type of comparison or apples to apples, but it's close enough where it's much closer than it is to a uh, hospital system in the Philippines. I am 54 years old and am behind retirement. Do you think nursing can help me catch up with a decent retirement? Is it too late to get a Roth, a Roth IRA? Uh, you know, if you start now, well, here's the, here's the way you got to look at it. You could just continue doing whatever it is that you're doing. And, you know, by the time you're 65, you'll, you'll still be, still be behind. Or if you truly want to get into nursing, you could get into nursing, even if you get a two-year degree, right? Get your ADN. And um, once you get your job as a nurse, you'll be, let's say, let's say you'll be 57, right? 58, 57, 58. You still have about, uh, what, like seven years to invest your money and then retire and possibly have at least a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand dollars saved up in your investment account, at least, because Monica and I have been investing in our four hundred one k now for about four years each, and we each have at least a hundred and twenty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? So it's totally possible, and that's after five years. So after seven years, it's possible that you may have up to two hundred thousand dollars in your investment account, and then at least you'll have that, and you may also have a pension might be a small pension, but you might also have a pension to fall back on, right? So, um, yeah, so I, I would say if you truly wanted to be a nurse, go ahead and do it. The one caveat that I will say is nursing has become very digital over the last decade or so. So if, if you have a hard time with computers, then you need to be ready 
for the fact that you will be doing everything on the computer. You're going to be charting on the patient's chart. Um, you're going to be medicating and you're going to be doing all of that through the computer. You might be scanning medication. So all those things are done on the computer. So I would say start getting used to that now before you even become a nurse as well. So that once you are a nurse, you will understand how the computer systems work. Okay. All right. Next. Uh, so Joe said, Memorial Sloan Kettering is the best hospital employer. I heard HSS doctors and APP are mean and treat nurses like trash. I guess it really depends then because I worked at, well, I did my clinicals at one of the HSS units and the nurses, it was an orthopedic unit, uh, like met, like post or orthopedic surgery or something like that. Um, but the nurses like praised the hospital and so did my clinical instructor and my clinical instructor would rotate from like unit to unit with her students so like they all loved it there but memorial sloan is definitely better it's definitely better okay next the patients are uh pretty easily easy medically here at hss yeah that's true <laughs> we, uh, i want to be bored i want to be bored okay thanks for the info <laughs> you're great good vibes thank you okay this may be out of topic but which high yield savings account do you recommend to start with? Well, personally, I have two of them. I have uh, Wealthfront and I also have, and the reason I like Wealthfront is because you can manage all of your accounts through there and it, it, and you can um, chart, like find out what your net worth is when you have a, net, uh, a Wealthfront account, as well as being able to open up your own savings account. So that's one. And I also use Ally. So those are the two that I use. And that's because they've been in business for a long time now. And, um, but you know, you can use another bank like Schwab and uh, Pr I think Prudential is another one. Um, there's like some that are, I would just go for the highest yield savings account if I were you. Just look up, Google, go on Google, type in high yield savings accounts and go with the one that has the longest history. So the bank that has the longest history and the highest yield, right? Let's keep it. How to become a millionaire in nursing? Uh, <laughs> well, you can do what Lambo does and just work, you know, 80 days, 80 hours uh, a week and do that for two years and you'll be a millionaire um, because he was making $600,000 a year. So in two years, you can make 1.2 million if that's what you do. But that's just the gross salary, right? After taxes, that's only going to be like let's say, about, I don't know, six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars. So you do that for three years, and you'll be a millionaire if if that's what you want. But in my opinion, being a millionaire doesn't mean much, because in all honesty, uh, that doesn't go a long way. That million dollars will be long gone within two to three years, because you're going to start. And I mean, you could withdraw, let's say. And it also depends where you live. But you let's say you withdraw 4% per year to play it safe, right? That's the golden rule. You withdraw 4% of 1 million that you have invested. That means every year you will have $40,000. And that would be $40,000 um, that, let's see. Yeah, let's say $40,000 that you could use and move to a third world country. Let's you know move to Bali, uh, Thailand move to uh, Vietnam, move to the Philippines, move to Mexico, and you could live off of that easily if that's what you want to do. But if you want to live in the U.S., that's going to be a lot harder to do. So I would say to play it safe, to play it very safe, you should have at least $2 million in an investment or a $2 million net worth and a net worth that allows you to withdraw 4% per year until you you know for the rest of your life because then you'll have at least eighty thousand dollars my personal goal is to have at least one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year that i can withdraw uh when i withdraw the four percent from my investments which is like would have to be 3.75 million invested in order to be able to withdraw i think it's 3.75 million in order to withdraw 4% of that and have 
in my bank account every single year. Uh, but, you know, to each their own, that's just, and this was my way of thinking before. This was when I started the YouTube channel. Now that I see that there's so much potential in how much money you can make when you start a business, that number has actually gone up. So honestly, I think I would be like truly, truly satisfied when I have, let's say at least, at least like $10 million in investments before I retire. And, and, you know, I, I'm willing to put all of the work that it takes in my business so that I can have that much money every single year, because $10 million would be, let's say, I believe it's like $400,000 per year. Um, if you withdraw 4%, right? So I think that's a decent amount of money that I can live off of, but and that number might go up. I don't know. We'll see. All right, let's move on to the next one. I hope you don't mind. Is Monica Filipino? Yes, she is. She is Filipino. I know nursing can be laborious. As I said, I am 55 years old. What specialty should I choose as a new nurse fresh out of nursing school? I plan to get my ADN. Um, you know, any position that you can get a job in that you're willing to work in is good enough. If you want to be a school nurse, go ahead and apply for that. If you want to work in um, a clinic, go ahead and apply for that. If you want to work at a med spa, go ahead and apply for that. There's so many different positions. If you want to be a, a content writer for like a nursing blog and make money that way, you can do that too. There's just so many different ways. All right, Nurses to Riches, I had an interview with Kaiser SoCal in med surge, but I turned it down because I wanted to interview with a North, North Cal Kaiser for ICU. Was that a bad decision? You know what? It depends. If you're in another state, then... I would say it's, it's a good decision, but if you're in California already and you're in SoCal, I would have taken it. And then while I was applying, while I was working there, because you can work there for six months, take that job, work there for six months, and then apply internally for a position in Northern California, because you have access to the internal the internal uh, postings that external candidates don't have access to. All right. Which high yield savings account do you recommend? Okay, so that is it true? In my case, I was told that um, by my accountant that in my full time job, I am being taxed in a 24% tax bracket. And in my per diem job, I am only being taxed in 11% tax bracket when they combine my salary. Oh, okay. So I think what they mean by that is that, and 11%, that kind of makes no sense. Um, I believe the lower one was 11%. I think what they mean is that whatever you earn at your per diem job is going to be taxed at the highest bracket. And yes, that's true. Um, and that's because they, you already know how much you're getting paid from your part-time job or your, your full-time job, right? Um, so let's say you make 100000 from your full-time job. Any amount in addition to that, which would be from your per diem job, is going to be taxed at the highest bracket. So, yes, that's true. But let's say you did that at your permanent job, at your staff job, and you work additional hours at your staff job. It would be taxed at the higher tax bracket because you're picking up extra hours. So it's the same thing. All right. Let's go on to the next one. Oh, it's Nanel. What is up, Nanel? Oh man, I haven't spoken with you in such a long time. <laughs> I miss you, Nanel. Nanel. So if you guys don't know, Nanel actually interviewed me. She's a nurse from the UK and she interviewed me on one of her videos. And after she interviewed me, my channel went from like 5,000 subscribers to like 12,000 within like a few weeks. That's the time where our channel was like blowing up and it hasn't done that since. So I appreciate Nanel so much. And her and I were always chatting with each other on WhatsApp because she's one of the only other nursing YouTubers I know that is just as obsessed with YouTube as I am. So I really wish there were more YouTubers out there that were super passionate about creating content and growing their income through social media and YouTube specifically, because I would love to have a group of nurses like that. And if you're a nurse who's, who's doing that right now, please reach out to me because I, I need more friends like that. All right. Yo, my total annual salary goes to a higher tax bracket and I ended up by 
up owing taxes to the federal and state tax. Yeah, because um, it, I, you are going to end up paying taxes because you're going to be at a higher tax bracket. That's why. But at the end of the day, you're still making more money. Even if you're taxed at a higher tax bracket, you're still bringing home more money. So I hope that makes sense. Okay. I can really see the spread. Oh, oh, I can really see the spreadsheet. Is there a way to get the link to the spreadsheet? Yeah, you can get the spreadsheet. It's going to be in the description below, or you can go to, let's see, I'm just going to share it with you real quick, but um, let's see, I'm going to share a tab. Okay. Uh, this one, share. All right. So you can just um, go to my website. You type in, let's say you go to Nurses to Riches. Oh, that's interesting. What is that? Oh, <laughs> okay. So you go to nurses to riches.com, right? And you can click on shop. There's free downloads in there. That was just one thing that I uh, provided for free. But here on the website, you can go to this link right here. And it says, uh, let me see. I just got to make sure you guys are seeing that. No, actually, you're not seeing that. So let me make it bigger. Okay. So you go to shop, right? And then it's going to be down here, um, this one right here. Okay. It's going to say ultimate salaries for nurses. Let me see if I can make it bigger so you guys can see. And you click there. <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, you can just skim through so you can see what it looks like. But you guys already know what it looks like because I've been showing it to you, right? And uh, you can add it to the cart or buy it now. And all you need is Google Sheets. Um, actually, you access it with your Google Sheets account. And you can just make a copy and you can do whatever with it that you want. You can do all the research through it. Okay, next. Let's go. <clears throat> Okay, thank you uh, for the info. Very informative. Cool. How many shares you bought when you started investing? What stocks? Okay, so um, let's see. I was maxing out my 401k. So was Monica. We made sure we both maxed out our 401ks. And that means, you know, we were putting away at the time it was 19,500. Now it's up to like 21, 22,000. Um, but we were doing the maximum amount. And our, our employer was contributing a portion of that, which was like one point four percent or something like that 1.45 percent so um yeah so that's what we were doing but in addition to that we opened up a fidelity brokerage account and we were investing money from our paychecks after we got paid in a taxable brokerage account and we were investing in index funds we weren't investing in individual stocks although i will say we did invest in individual stocks at the beginning like um i remember the game not gamestop um there was another stock. Uh, what was it? Well, Figs was one of them. And, you know, I bought into Figs when it first came out, when it was first launched. Uh, uh, they had the initial public offering. And I remember I put it, I think I bought it each share for like $30 or something like that. But if you look now, <laughs> um, and, and I'll show you why. So share my screen. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you look now and you go on Google, google.com, and then you type in figs stock, you're going to see that it's worth $6.47. Okay. <laughs> now, that's how much it's worth, which is why I ended up selling that stock. And you know, I only invested like one less than 1% of our overall net worth on something like that, because I'm not willing to put in a lot of my money in individual stocks. Most of our income was going towards index funds. And the difference is that index funds are like a pot full of in a lot of different companies. And when you put in your money, a portion of your money goes a different portion of your money goes towards owning each of those companies in the pot, right? So that's what I did, and that's what I continue to do. However, I will say something, okay? This is something that I need to admit to you guys, and I haven't said it yet because I plan to talk about it in a future video, but Monica and I, like two weeks ago, we withdrew all of the money that we had in our taxable brokerage account, which was like $26,000, $28,000. 
And the reason for that is because we want to invest in our business. And the way I look at it is I treated this investment, not just as an investment, but also as a uh, an emergency fund because we didn't have an actual emergency fund. That was it. That was the plan. And when I looked at it, because the stock market hasn't been doing so well over the last two years or so, we were still investing in a total stock market index fund. We were investing in an S&P 500 index fund. Our, the growth of those investments had stagnated. Like we were at like negative 600 from like the peak two years ago. So the way I looked at it was, you know what? I'm going to withdraw this money instead of asking for a loan for our business because it doesn't make sense. We don't want to be in any debt. So we withdrew that money and now we just have it in our bank account so we can spend it on our business. And the spending that we've done so far is we've invested in a mentorship program, which was $6,800. And we've purchased a lot of inventory for the clothing brand that we wanted to start. We're still working on that, but I mentioned to you guys in the last episode that in the last live stream that our mentor said we should speak to our YouTube audience and ask them what they want us to do, what you guys want us to do. And you guys resoundingly said that you would prefer we work on building a mentorship program for you. So being that you said that, we decided to put the clothing brand um, as a side hustle and this mentorship program that we will be working on as the main thing. So if you guys want specific things included in that mentorship program, go ahead and let me know in the chat or in the comment section. And I'll see if I can work it into the mentorship program. Okay. Also, I plan to include the spreadsheets, all of the spreadsheets in the mentorship program, as well as my plan is to basically um, you know, coach you guys or mentor you guys who are looking to make more money as nurses, whether that's being an employee or someone who's looking to get into content creation or starting a business. Because um, the way I look at it is if I would have known all of this information back before I, when I first became a nurse, if I knew I could have moved to California and Sacramento and made more money as a nurse so that I could invest my money, if I knew this as a new grad, I would have done it a long time ago. I wouldn't have waited. We waited, what, like three, no, like four or five years before we moved to California after working as nurses. Um, so I wish I would have known all of this information before that. And I know there's many people across the country that want some guidance because you guys, I, I, you know, there's just so much that I can do in the videos. And I do it like openly, right? Like I just showed you the spreadsheet. I do all of that openly, but there's something different about having someone guide you step by step, every step of the way to make the process easier and having tasks for you to complete in order for you to get to your end goal. And the end goal is, let's say the average salary for nurses is 80 to $82,000 a year. The end goal should be to make at least between $150,000 to $200,000 a year working the same number of hours that you would have been working had you been working in another state, right? Um, and, and that's my goal. That's part of it, right? That's part of what I want to include in the mentorship pro program is to get you from making, let's say, even you're working in a lower paying state, you're making like fifty dollars to $60,000 a year to making $150,000 to $200,000 a year. That's part of the goal, but there's other parts of it because I want you, you know, someone mentioned in a previous video that I should talk about creating income from social media and content creation and YouTube videos. And I don't know how much that's gonna appeal to you guys, but I honestly believe that having a social media presence is the key to having a thriving business. Because if you look at all of these like super wealthy business owners, many of them have a presence on social media one way or another, right? So I feel like that's gonna be part of it as well. And then, um, yeah, I, I also, someone reached out to me and I think I might um, work with either Porsche or this other person that reached out to me recently for nurses that are not, for people who are not nurses yet, who want to look at, becoming nurses. 
and they want to do it in the fastest way possible and the cheapest way possible. So I'm hoping to have a path laid out for, for every single one of you who's looking to do something like that. And then once you do become nurses, then hopefully you'll continue on to the course and work at one of the highest paying hospitals or one of the highest paying cities in the entire country and make more money than you ever imagined. So that, that's the goal with this whole course thing, right? Okay, uh, let's see, what's up? Okay, do travel nurses still make 100K plus? Yeah, absolutely, um, it's still possible. I mean, I'm working with a travel nurse right now that I interviewed recently, actually, and uh, she's making a decent amount. I, I forgot, how, actually, you know what, I didn't ask her, but average is about three to 4,000, about, just about, I would say three thousand to four thousand dollars a week is still possible. So you know, if you multiply four thousand by fifty-two, you're still making a like. But that's if you're working every single week. You're making about two hundred thousand dollars a year. So it's still possible, All right? Is it possible to skip med search for new grads? Absolutely. There's so many nurses, even in the chat, who went straight to like ICU or 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 um, ED. Do you recommend having a traditional IRA if you already if you are already contributing to your employer 401k? Um, I would say the Roth IRA. You should do a backdoor Roth IRA if you can. Um, but uh, yeah, I would totally recommend it because that's going to grow tax free, and then you can pull it out in retirement tax free. Okay. Hi, Jason. Thank you for continually providing pertinent information to nurses and those pursuing the profession. Thank you for watching. For tax purposes, is it better to work overtime on your primary job or have two jobs? Any suggestions on how to get into a specialty after only working med surge telly? It really depends because if your hourly rate um, is going to be higher, just working overtime, which it probably is, then I would just do the overtime. And that's why I have I work with so many nurses who work who have tried to work per diem at other locations. And then they realize how much overtime our coworkers are getting and how much overtime they're picking up. And I'll give you an example. So I make $100 per hour. And if I go somewhere else and work per diem, I may make, let's say, $80 per hour, $90 per hour. And that's a non-Kaiser location. But if I just pick up overtime at my current location and I pick up time and a half, I'm making $150 per hour for four hours of work, right? Like, let's say I only do four hours, which is equivalent to making $100 an hour for, or yeah, $100 for, per hour for, I believe, six hours or something like that, right? So um, I would prefer to do that instead of going somewhere else on my days off to pick up extra shifts. And, and you know, think about it. Like, would you really want to do that? Uh, I personally stopped doing overtime. I haven't done overtime in two years. And I know you guys watched my previous videos where I was working like 18 days in a row, but I don't do that anymore. I am at a point where I don't honestly need the money from overtime anymore. Monica and I are working less than 20 hours a week and we don't need the overtime. So I don't need to pick it up because, you know, I feel like the more time we put into YouTube and content creation and growing a brand, growing a business, the more money we we have passive money we have because as you can see from the beginning of the video when i was breaking down how much money we're making every year it's growing exponentially so like last year you know i was only making a few like a thousand something i think a thousand ninety nine dollars per month now i'm making twenty eight hundred dollars per month you know and that's it, it's it feels active but honestly though if i'm not creating a video, let's say I just step away, I go on a vacation, it's still passive. I'm still making that money. Uh, I can't take a long break for too long when it comes to YouTube because if I stop posting videos, then no one's going to watch my videos. So that can become ultimately, like that's the downside to social media. But there's different ways to monetize it, you know? And sponsorships, as you can see, I made like $10,000 just from two sponsored videos. So it's and that's something also that I would love to include or incorporate in the course because people don't realize that they need to value themselves more than they think they're valued. Because uh, I'm, I'm sure that I'm probably the only person that ever asked for $5,000 to these companies that I work for. 
at least five thousand dollars okay All right so how many bank accounts uh hyza retirements credit cards should a financially literate person have don't have too many <laughs> you're going to be overwhelmed with the credit cards the retirement accounts the, uh, all of that don't have so many you only need um one high yield savings account um you only need well i would say for retirement accounts it really depends because if you have a five uh if you have a 401k and you have a roth ira that's two already and then if you have a partner they might have two as well so that's four and then if you start adding on like brokerage accounts to that and 529 accounts that's that's going to become overwhelming um it's easy to manage though because if you're not someone who's day trading it doesn't matter like you purchase things and you put them on autopilot meaning that you just have a certain percentage of your paycheck going towards it every single pay period then you don't have to worry about how many you have right as long as you set them up properly initially and then when it comes to credit cards it really depends because monica and i since we have a business so we have our llc we also have a dba under our llc we have two credit cards for those for the business and two checking accounts for the business we also have our personal um a personal account we have two high yield savings accounts and then we have um an, a united credit card and we have a chase credit card personal credit card so that's a lot of cards and then we have an amazon card right and then we also have uh let's see uh it's called a bnh photo card a photo video card which is basically a card that allows us to purchase camera equipment from bnh photo and video tax-free and that's why we got it we don't want to have to pay taxes on that because their workaround, the way they do it is that we don't have to end up paying the taxes at the end of the year to our business. What they do is they actually deduct the amount of taxes that you would have to pay on your equipment when you purchase the item. So that's that's pretty cool. I love doing that. Okay. All right. Um, next. Let's go. Put in a uh, REIT account, $3 million and get a 7%. Yeah, that's true. Well, it depends. Um, but yeah, you can get 7% dividend. I mean, that's okay. That is true. I had a dividend. Uh, who was it? I was doing dividend investing when I first got into investing, and I, my money is still in there. But I only invested a small portion, like a thousand dollars, to see how well it would grow, and it hasn't grown much. Okay. Will med surge become outdated in the future? Uh, oh, nursing. Med surge is not going to become outdated, just like most nursing professions or specialties won't. Okay, guys, um, I think we're coming to an end, but uh, let me just read a few. Is California as bad as they make it seem crime-wise? Yes and no. It depends on the city. Because when Monica and I did our, we actually, before, when we were thinking, let's move to New York, we have to move to New York, um, we decided to go on a road trip this past summer so we can explore most of California before we leave. And when we took that road trip, we realized just how beautiful California like really is. There are just so many beautiful parts to California that not many people see on the news. They don't see it on TikTok. They don't see it on YouTube. Um, and, and I'm talking about like, and if you think about it, the coastline of California spans all the way from north of California, all the way to the southern tip of California. It's the state with like one of the, it's the state with the most coastline of any state. If, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, you know, I, we went to Santa Monica. We went to like Manhattan Beach. We went to San Diego. Then we went all the way back around and we went up towards um, the Sierras. And we also went to Antelope Canyon, not Antelope Canyon, sorry. Uh, there's, a, there's this place on the Eastern side of the Sierras, which is so pretty. And if I remember it, I'll let you guys know in the comments, but um, we just, there's like so many different types of environments in California that you have so much to choose from. And along that road trip, the only times we actually saw, you know, places where there would be high crime were in cities like San Francisco, where you see homeless people everywhere. You see break-ins into cars all the time. 
And um, I know people who live in San Francisco are probably hearing this and they're like, oh, that's not really true for all parts of San Francisco. But in all honesty, we've lived here for six, six seven years and we've gotten our car broken into twice in San Francisco. One of them was when Monica was with coworkers over there and they had a rental. Another one was our personal car. So that only happened in San Francisco, right? And then, um, you know, uh, LA, downtown LA region is just full of homeless people. Like, and there's a lot of crime that happens around there too, because there's a lot of mentally ill and uh, people that are on drugs. So places like that, yeah, you're going to see a lot of it. And unfortunately, those are some of the places that have the highest populations, like LA has the highest population, which is why you hear about all of this crime happening in areas like that. Okay. But there's more places to California than that. And if you ever take a trip to California, just drive around all of California and you're going to see just how beautiful it actually is. All right. And uh, one last thing I should mention is we live in Sacramento, but there's so many different parts surrounding Sacramento where the crime rate is very low, extremely low. So if you work in Sacramento, you can always choose to live 20 minutes away from the city and you're going to be in a safe neighborhood. OK, all right. But um, yeah, I wish I could read all of these comments, guys. I'm sorry I can't, but I've been on this for like two hours now. So I will see you guys on next week at 6 p.m. Pacific time. All right. See you guys.